Hello and welcome to International Voices, the May edition. This podcast focuses on some of the global and intercultural teaching and learning efforts that are taking place in Missoula County Public Schools and the advantages and disadvantages of such efforts. This is a two-part series. Part one is this podcast featuring five elementary school teachers, Barbara Matz from Rattlesnake School, Ashley Flanagan, and Amanda Ranstrom, both teachers at Janet Rankin School, Andrew Wyatt from Lewis and Clark School, and Carla Wohler from Chief Shalo School. In addition, Vinnie Giamona, principal at Chief Shalo School, will provide an educational leadership perspective on global and intercultural teaching and learning. Part two will be focusing on middle and high school teachers and will be released in early June. I am your host and moderator, Udo Fluck, Director of Global and Cultural Affairs in Arts Missoula. One of my service branches is a K-12 educational outreach program that offers over 200 global and intercultural competence-building seminars to Missoula School District students. It collaborates with 30 teachers in elementary, middle, and high schools and inspires over 600 students annually. It is offered free to students and teachers through the generous support of the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. Preparing today's students to live and thrive in this increasingly interdependent world can start early, earlier than one might think. Here is the Missoula model. I would like to welcome Carla Wohler, second grade teacher from Chief Shalo Elementary School in Missoula, to this panel. Thank you, Udo. Excited to be answering these questions today. Well, same here. Thanks for joining me. I think we'll start out with um, sort of this question of how global and intercultural awareness and competence can help students develop skills to interact respectfully with those who are different from them. So my background is in elementary and, um, you know, as we know, really young children are just very egocentrical by nature. Um, And what makes sense to them is what is directly attached to them. But as children start to mature a little bit, like the primary grades, um, it is just the perfect time to start really talking and learning about different cultures and to just really expand um, because they are ready at that point to start to learn about things that are a little bit more abstract, a little bit further from just their own self. And, you know, I, children our age also are just very visual learners. So I think it's so important that they see different clothing, that they see um, and or taste different foods. I mean, even when we just have a little child, we want to expose them to different foods. So just like even young children, uh, primary learners are at just the perfect age to start with all of this. And once they have that foundation and background of different countries, different cultures, different clothing, then they can make connections back again to themselves. Um, And they are much healthier connections, healthier um, kind of opinions that they form once they have had exposure. So discussions are just really interesting at this age. The questions that they have, just the awareness that they start to become when they're just watching TV, things that they bring back and ask about. So I just think... um, it's just really important to us to, to make sure that we start this at a young age because then you do have that background and that respect starts to grow. When you actually first approached me about piloting this program, I actually taught first grade and my first thoughts were, oh boy, I don't know, <laughs> honestly. Right. But the fact that your program uses hats as a vehicle to move the children around the world. Uh, You know, you have to have something like that. You have to have a visual. You have to have something to capture their interest and um, 
Yeah, it just, it, it's a pretty amazing what they can learn. And um, no, I think those young minds are very pliable, very open, very curious. It's a great time. Yeah, you know, I guess the obvious answers would be, uh, well, we look at a map of the world and we learn geography, we learn mapping skills, or uh, as we learn about these different countries, we learn about habitats, we learn about different landforms. Those are kind of the, the obvious answers. But um, just to give you a few examples from just our second grade curriculum right now, our children in second grade in Missoula County Public Schools read a nonfiction piece called Friends Around the World. And there are four children around the world. It is nonfiction, so there are photographs. And these children are emailing each other and they talk about the different foods they eat, the different way that they go to school, what their cities are like. And um, we had that as before you came into our classroom. So it was kind of a little setup exactly for what we would be doing. And it was such a great way to see how the literature we read fit in with this. Another example I can think of this year, we read a biography about Theodore Roosevelt. And we then later in the year had a lesson with you about the Panama Jack hat. And so you talked about Panama, talked about the culture, but part of the lesson hit on the Panama Canal and um, Teddy Roosevelt, how he was really in instrumental into that. And it was just, I mean, it just perfectly dovetailed with what we had previously learned. And one, the day that you left after the Panama Jack, one of my children said to me, hey, he knew who Teddy Roosevelt was, you know, like most adults wouldn't know, but they don't know that. And he was, they were just like really pleased that you knew about this whole thing that they had learned. And again, just another way that something we had done in our English language arts program just completely connected. What role you think parents can play in their child developing uh, a global and intercultural competence? So parents are the key. And parents are really the key for so much of their child's learning. Um, no matter what it is that we are trying to teach at school, it uh, unless parents support that and continue to expose children, it doesn't go to a deeper level. And I think this, in this case, even more, because there are just so many biases and so many prejudices um, about different people groups, different nationalities. Well, and one hopes that the learning doesn't sort of stop uh, when the bell rings and when the teacher leaves the classroom, but that there is some kind of a continuation happening in whatever shape or form this may be, but um, you're making the connection with, with parents and the, the, the parents' involvement would, uh, would sort of support that idea that whatever is covered in the classroom um, could connect to a discussion uh, at dinner table, at the dinner table, or um, at some kind of a game that could be played at home, or whatever it may be, where this sort of connects to um, to something outside of the original classroom setting. So I'm 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 happy to to hear that that you think that this is key to the whole thing to continue and make that learning even richer. Well, you know, I would even hope um, if a child if they were to come home and bring up, hey, we heard about this place or this in class, you know, I, I would hope parents wouldn't be intimidated. And I know, I don't know anything about Egypt or, but then use that as a springboard, um, you know, or, and even to say, wow, that's interesting. I don't know much about let, what can we find out? Or what, what did you learn? I mean, take cues from our children and their curiosity, their desire to learn as well. So, yes, we are a team of three this year up at Chief Charlo, and um, we've just been so fortunate to be able to do this program for so many years. Um, each year, we it's just something that we really plan, plan and plug in at a specific time to make sure that the students have background and are ready for this. Uh, it has fit so well this year with the pandemic because, I mean, that's a strange thing to say, but with remote learning, 
um, you know, we've been so thankful that you have been able to provide us with this learning to continue, but in a virtual way. With this background, um, the three of us have just been so thankful that the, the children have a little bit more of a global understanding and how things could move from country to country, and also that we've been able to continue this in a virtual platform. Well, you're very welcome. I, uh, you know, we were in the middle of this um, uh, when spring break came around. I think we had probably done seven or eight of the 15 sessions. And so it was just about in the middle. And, and I was thinking, um, I don't want this virus uh, sort of stop the whole thing. And, and what could be done uh, that we could continue this, even if it's not in the, in the same way we did it, uh, the, the the first seven weeks, but what could be done? And, and so um, this worked out really nicely. And the fact that uh, that the feedback that you have shared uh, where students have done this at home with their parents and the parents even uh, connected to the material because they were either, uh, they've either lived there in the foreign country that we are focusing on, or uh, they might have traveled there, or they might have studied there when they were young, whatever the situation was. But I'm so glad that um, that this could continue and wasn't sort of abruptly stopped uh, because of the pandemic. And so I, I learned a lot by just taking this online because some of the things, as you know, work well in a classroom setting. When you take them into a digital format, it it's, it loses its luster. It's sort of, you know, you look at the same exercise and you go, well, the air is kind of out of that one. And so some of the things one just had to adjust to. But overall, I was pretty pleased with the fact that, um, you know, one can hold the hat into the camera and, and sort of say, well, yeah, let's look at this. And how is this different from the previous hat? And what's the material? And, you know, how wide is the brim and all of that? So um, I think Online has actually been um, a great uh, sort of alternative for this to continue. And I was thinking earlier in January about sort of potential program growth and uh, how other schools could be connected. And I saw myself uh, sort of on the edge of being at my capacity. And I thought I cannot possibly go to more schools in the fall but now with this online thing, it actually sort of allows for this growth to happen. And, and so that's the whole, you know, one always looks for the, perhaps the silver lining in something. Um, and while there is nothing good about the pandemic whatsoever, um, probably it was a catalyst for, uh, for something else to happen or to continue. So, I agree. We sure appreciate it. But next year we get dibs on you live in the classroom. <laughs> You will. Um, you will, absolutely. And I, and I so appreciate that we're still doing that um, six years later um, because you guys were among, like I said, when we started out, among the three pilot schools when we started this in 2014. And, and, and nothing says more than, than I think a program that has run uh, for six years. And it's all because you guys continue every year to say, we, we want to have this again, and we want to be able to share this with the students. So it's, it's thanks to you uh, that this has uh, grown over uh, the years and, and was able to be maintained that way. Thanks, Udo. We appreciate, and especially oh. all the videos. It's been great. Oh, you're most welcome. I would like to thank Carla Wohler, second grade teacher from Chief Charlo Elementary School in Missoula for being on this panel. I would like to welcome Vinny Giamona, Principal at Chief Charlo Elementary School in Missoula, to this podcast. Chief Charlo is a STEAM school, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, the Arts, and Math. STEAM classrooms create a climate that is very hospitable to cultural and global education, guiding students' inquiry, dialogue, and critical thinking. Chief Charlo was also one of the three pilot schools back in 2014 when I launched the Global and Intercultural Competence Outreach Program. With Carla Wohler's perspective earlier as a teacher at Chief Charlotte School, I feel very fortunate to have you as a principal 
providing an administrative viewpoint on global and intercultural education. Thank you for taking the time to be with me today. Yes, I appreciate you uh, inviting me on, Udo. Um, I, I think I would like to start with the question, as a school leader, where do you see the overall benefits of a global and intercultural education offered at the elementary level? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think as, as you look at that larger lens as a building, and really more, Udo, as a school community, I think, you know, where, where we want to be first is we want to be a welcoming environment for all families in our school community. So I think uh, at that very foundation, we want to be a building that uh, is open, is inviting, is understanding and appreciative, appreciative of where all of our students and families come from. And so I think as you look first kind of as that smaller lens, as just a, a, a strong school community, that understanding is vital to make sure that we have the support and that we have um, that appreciation for who all is around us as a school. I think as you move that lens back further and you start talking about your students, um, it's just a, such a strong pathway into knowledge and collaboration with other students and with, with faculty and, and as really our students with their community. You know, you and I have talked uh, when we launched this in 2014, um, you know, sometimes at this age and where our kiddos are uh, developmentally, they can, they can be pretty narrow in terms of what they understand around them and what is their community. And oftentimes that could be as simple as my community is, is my school and my family. And so we talked a lot about how do we expand that understanding. And so I think with the collaboration that we've had with you, being an, being an identified STEAM school, we brought in the University of Montana. We brought in uh, so many speakers and artists and scientists and, and these people that come with such this wealth of knowledge about the community and the larger world that it becomes be kind of this inherent, inherent understanding of, oh, there are things past my wall. There are things past my street. And this knowledge is going to help me be successful as I grow. And so when I look at it as an administrator, how is this going to impact our kiddos? What are they going to learn from this cultural awareness? What pathways are they going to develop as learners? We recognize more than ever that we're a pretty connected globe. And so, you know, I think as students, it's important for them to understand that they're going to have these interactions with a variety of different people, cultures, um, and it's so important for them to understand as early as possible, how do we navigate and grow and collaborate with so many different people? You um, are a very involved principal. I've seen you peek into classrooms when things are going on, <laughs> yep. and you've come into mind when I was there. Um, yep. What have you observed as far as uh, the kids connecting to outside perspectives when you yeah. have gone into the classrooms? Yeah, it's been it's been amazing. And, and you're right. I think one of the you know, we're, we're all stretched uh, as educators. But one of the things I I really do try to prioritize is getting into every classroom every day, even if it's for a brief moment, just to get a pulse and, and a feel for what are our kids learning in the classroom the importance that they recognize me as as not just a face, but as a, as a person and someone that they know and can trust. So, you know, I appreciate you recognizing that uh, and, and that effort to try to get in there. I think the great piece uh, that I observe in the classroom, especially during, um, you know, I think back to Udo, your time with our second graders, just the real and genuine conversation that kids have about that larger, as you said, that global and international perspective. It's great to see kids as their eyes light up about another culture or another part of the world or that really goes on there or they really wear those things or that's how that's made. And, and I think what's so awesome, Udo, is we talk so much about relevant material to kids. We talk a lot about as, as educators and, and as a staff, how do we make our curriculum most relevant to kids? And when you make it relevant to kids, they're going to move up to those higher levels of understanding and it's going to become applicable to them and they're going to be able, and what we want them to do is how do you apply this learning outside these walls? And so I think you talk about what a great vessel when you talk about cultural and international well awareness to use that vessel to make it relevant to them. And then they're going to go home 
and they're going to make it relevant to their home life and then their larger city. And I think it just, it kind of dominoes on itself in such a positive way. So I think I've always taken away from your lessons and, and a lot of our curriculum uh, that we're using now has more of a cultural feel to it, which has been nice to see. Um, you know, I'll go into a, a lesson where, where a staff member may be teaching um, our literacy and we may have a, an excerpt or a chapter um, that talks about cultural awareness or another part of the world. And so our kids, because every kid in our building got your program, they're able to take, if they're in third, fourth, fifth grade, they're not only applying what they learned from you, but what became relevant to them now is into their other piece of literature and their content. And so what I've always loved is just that light bulb. And we always talk about that with our kids, that moment that they say, oh, well, I, I get this. Oh, I understand that they do that here and we do it, we do it in Missoula this way. And maybe this is why we do it in Missoula this way. Or maybe this is why it's so meaningful as a Montanan or that's so meaningful for them um, where they live. And I think that's always what you look, look for, right? Is, is are our kiddos processing the information? And it's always been so fun to watch uh, your lessons and see that rich dialogue between the kiddos and them get to try to figure out, well, how is this relevant to my world? And then take it back to the larger global piece. I'd like to thank Vinny Giamona, the principal of Chief Charlo Elementary School in Missoula, for being a participant in this panel, for providing the administrative viewpoint on the whole global and intercultural education piece. And thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Fluke. You, you have uh, done such a great job for our city. And we've been so fortunate to have your knowledge and resources. And we appreciate, you know, all that you've provided us at Chief Charlo and as, and as a district. And uh, look forward to partnering with you down the road. So thank you so much. I would like to thank Vinny Giamona, Principal at Chief Charlo Elementary School in Missoula, for his participation. I would like to welcome Barbara Matz, third grade teacher from Rattlesnake Elementary School in Missoula, to the panel. The idea of global and intercultural awareness and competence obviously has the direct connection to, um, to content and delivering material that helps a student to learn in a certain way. But can it also help students develop skills to interact respectfully um, with other students that um, are different from them would be my first question to you. Uh, yes, Udo, thanks for having me. Um, I feel that with the global and the intercultural awareness and competency, um, it helps students develop empathy. Uh, it also sparks their interest and it helps them socially. And it also helps them become better global citizens in and out of the classroom. Building on this, how can embracing cultural differences in the classroom assist students in understanding sort of multiple perspectives and provide students with a greater adaptability? Well, I find my students are very good at this. They, they can include the culturally diverse peers in daily activities in the classroom, such as recess when they're out on the playground, lunch, uh, helping them learn the ropes uh, around the building and outside, even small group work and partner work if a child is having difficulty. Uh, they can be friendly and helpful by explaining things that may be confusing and they can be good role models and, sh and show by example. I always tell my students that if you can only be one thing, choose to be kind. And they, <laughs> they are always ready and willing to help a classmate out. Would you, would you say that this adaptability uh, also would include to be more comfortable with change and ambiguity as far as students adjusting to different class schedules, to different teachers in their academic career at a school. Do you think that there's a connection there? I do. Um, they're used to being able to embrace these cultural differences in the classrooms. It does give them that adaptability, the empathy, and the understanding towards others. You know, I found that the classroom is always a diverse community and we're constantly learning and growing from one another. What role does the teacher play in students developing this global and intercultural competence? Uh, well, for starters, the teacher allows these programs, as this one, which is awesome, into the classroom 
as part of our curriculum. Um, it really helps and benefits us. Uh, then the teacher, we enhance, enhance it by using information, uh, using different materials, such as the atlas and other informational texts. Um, and that does remind me of a funny story. Um, and I, I know I've told you this one before, but I remember after your first visit, um, my students were anxious to locate the country that you had spoken about during class. So I decided to pull out the atlases and let the students explore. I was amazed at how excited they were to get that atlas in their hands. It honestly reminded me of a child on Christmas morning. <laughs> I, I was just totally baffled by, by their response. And I had a volunteer grandmother in my room and we seriously just looked at one another and we were like, what just happened? Because it was just the, the excitement in the classroom. It was just absolutely priceless. At last, but not least, how can students be encouraged so they can continue to develop their own global and intercultural competence outside of their traditional learning environments? Oh, I feel that just by the fact that students are being exposed to this information, and if they realize that they have that interest, then students will pursue it on their own. As we know, if a child is interested in something, you get them hooked and they will take it as far as they want to go with it. I think if you make students aware of it, that's an excellent way to start. Um, for example, you know, my sister and brothers and I, we grew up in a very small town. We never traveled much past the next town. Um, my mother was, was not really into that. However, my sister had a desire to see the world and she found a way to do just that. You know, she had that exposure at a very young age and she took it and she ran with it and it sparked a love of learning and travel to this day. How has the Global and Cultural Affairs K through 12 outreach program assisted in or facilitated the uh, infusion of your curriculum? The seminars that you've been doing have been wonderful. And as an educator, they've expanded my frame of reference uh, to share with my students. It's also opened my eyes to so many things and given me other avenues as to way I can introduce different topics and ideas with my students, which I may never have thought of before. I would like to thank Barbara Matz, third grade teacher from Rattlesnake Elementary School in Missoula for being on the panel. I'm thrilled to have Ashley Flanagan and Amanda Randstrom, both second grade teachers at Janet Rankin Elementary School in Missoula, join the podcast panel today. Can you please provide the listener with some background information on the global and cultural affairs K through 12 global and intercultural competence outreach program that is offered at your school? So we had the Global Competency start this year at Jeanette Rankin. It has taught our students map skills and about different cultures that they would otherwise not have been exposed to. And um, we had that offered at the second grade level. There were four different teachers involved and um, approximately 80 students um, this year in the 2019-2020 year. Okay. How did you hear about the program? So I, Ashley Flanagan, taught at Chief Charlotte second grade last school year. And um, we had that program going there. And when I moved over to Jeanette Rankin Elementary, I realized that they did not have the program at their school and was really eager to have that provided to my new students. And so I approached my new team and we had a meeting to see if that was something that they would be interested in. And they loved it and we jumped on it. How do the seminars that are offered in your classes connect to your existing curriculum? Yeah, so we actually have the last two years have had a new um, reading program um, called Ready Gen. And in that reading program, there are multiple authentic texts that we get. Um, and one of them might is the book Friends Around the World, where um, there are four different students that visit different places in the world. Um, and so our kids are already in reading. They're being exposed to cultures, but not enough of a deep background of them. So the seminars provide them with some more in-depth knowledge, and then they're able to connect 
um, the reading and then the seminars together. And those connections are pretty powerful as they um, typically come up with them on their own. Um, so that's not like a teacher directed. They'll raise their hand and say, oh, we heard about mm -hmm. this on Friday. Um, it also introduces map skills, which mm -hmm. in reading nonfiction and text features, there's a lot of map skills. Um, and it's not something that our reading curriculum is particularly strong in is teaching them about those skills and what those things mean. So the seminars actually strengthen their reading understanding of those nonfiction text features as well. Okay. We also have loved the spiral review that the seminars provide. So before they learn about a new culture, they always get to go back and review and just to see the knowledge that they remember. And as we're reading new books and re our reading curriculum or social studies, then they can go, oh yeah, I remember that. So the spiral review has been a key component in honestly their memory of the different cultures. It's also been huge for them to understand where they are in the world and the map skill where you always tied it back to Montana. So they would see, okay, this is where this culture is, where it is on the map. Now, where are we? And always taking it back to where are we in the United States? Because um, students really struggle with like continents, countries versus states. Um, so that is very powerful. And I think the spiral review every single seminar really helped ingrain that. And I, I also want to add the spiral review offered um, some extra practice for our our kids that are struggling academically, they got multiple exposures to that material um, rather than just seeing it one time and expected to remember it. Um, they every week got to do reviews of it. And so that helped those kids that typically are quiet and feel a little bit um, not so confident in their in the learning atmosphere. And so then when after several weeks of reviewing, they were able to jump and I noticed that my students were more inclined to answer questions a couple weeks in after have hearing and been exposed to material um, multiple times. Nope. And honestly, so you ended with our um, school in February and I had a Zoom call with some of my students today and I excitedly told them that we were doing this and I said, tell me what the coolest thing you still remember. And um, one of them just said the instruments, the drums, I loved the drums. And another one just kept saying the hats. I learned so many things about the different hats. So, I mean, we're a few months out and they're still remembering and they, they lit up. They, they want to hear what we had to say after we're done here. So that's great. Panama Canal stuck with that <laughs> a ton. And I'm not sure if that's because we get, we reference, um, that, yeah. We reference that a lot in our books, but I mean, every time that we were reading something, whether it was in a read aloud book or whether it was in reading, um, every time the Panama Canal came or Panama, they just got all excited and, and they could point directly to where the Panama Canal is. You were mentioning earlier when we started out that uh, the program involved uh, four teachers at Janet Rankin. Um, what have you heard from your colleagues? Was there, uh, were there similar experiences in that regard or anything that, because they can't be with us today, that you could share um, from their perspective? Um, we heard very similar things with the engagement as well, that the material was highly um, engaging. And so that way they had more students on task which is wonderful. We had a lot less behaviors than we might typically have in, in other blocks of the day. It was a, a bright spot in the kids' day, which is something they looked forward to. Um, the other teachers noted that they really appreciated the spiral review as well. And as we talked about earlier, um, the spiral review can sometimes take a long time, but I think it's very important, especially because um, the hat that we're going to is connected to the hat from before. And so just strengthening those understandings helps them to understand the new material better. And I did notice that um, the hats, as the review got on, um, we would review just a, the few hats before that hat. And then at the end, do a big, quick, whole group thing, which I thought was structured very, very well. Um, and that's what I got back from the other teachers as well, that they really liked the spiral review, the engagement, having the actual physical hat, which is something that um, um, Mrs. Flanagan and I really appreciate, but so did our colleagues, um, having that so the kids can see it and understand it. Um, and get to have some inquiry behind it as well. Like, why is it shaped like this? What does it look like this? Um, those types of things. Um, they like those, and we did as well. So 
And I can also say that we all unanimously agreed that we wanted this to come back next year. So it's not always easy to get teachers to agree. I mean, in two seconds, we voted yes. Yeah. And we tried to nail down a time and a day so we could get first pick. So if that's any um, indication of how we felt about it. (laughs) And not only that, but we also decided because we like the program so much that we also wanted to incorporate um, a little bit more time with it um, using some booklet type things for kids to keep track of their material. um, So that way they could go back to it and look back at what they've learned or look up facts that they have may have forgotten or just, you know, kind of look over it before we we come in. So we actually are going to try to carve out some more time next year to um, continue to develop um, their learning in this area. Yeah, we were so thankful for the rattlesnake teachers that shared that um, booklet that they made for their kids once you left to have a picture of the map, write a fact. Um, So then they have something to take home, even though they are writing in their journals each week. So their parents, they've actually got the map that goes with it because that is lacking. Um, And then they have a keepsake when they're all done and they can share that as well. So we were super thankful that the Rattlesnake teacher shared that with us. Well, I think it's it was nice to see that uh, teachers are not only looking at their schools and the benefit to their school, but that they are uh, willing to share within the district materials that they have developed. And I remember when I um, when I asked the colleagues at Rattlesnake if they would consider making this available, uh, it, it took uh, like a second. And they said, well, of course, um, it's great if they can use it in their classes too at Janet Rankin. So I think that that's really neat that that the teachers are connected in this network where um, you, know, you can all benefit from an educational tool or something that's been developed uh, and that can be used in other schools as well. So it's, it's, it speaks to you guys and, and, and how you like to support each other. Um, and on that note of, of uh, I, I really appreciate the interest and um, I, uh, I am uh, already thinking about the fall and uh, the spring and what this will look like, especially now with the, with the pandemic and how our educational landscape might change. And I want you to know that I have begun, um, I was done with Janet Rankin before the pandemic sort of started, but I was right in the middle with Chief Charlo and mm-hmm. Rattlesnake. And so I have begun to convert my units to an online format so that right now instruction is actually ongoing and they just upload my material to their regular um, online platform and then uh, students and parents can access it. So with that in mind, um, depending on you know what the decision will be um, as far as classes in the fall and in the spring of next year, but there 's definitely the option that there wasn 't before, and that is this hybrid idea that mm-hmm. perhaps one could come in and get this started, and then students could do certain things online, and then one could come back in person to do some more interaction in the classroom, and then students could do some more learning online or well, whatever the the percentage um, of in-class versus online would be, but that model is now there so we could take advantage of that. I would like to thank Ashley Flanagan and Amanda Randstrom, both teachers at Janet Rankin Elementary School in Missoula, for their participation. I would like to welcome Andrew Wyatt, fourth grade teacher from Lewis and Clark Elementary School in Missoula, to this podcast. Thank you for joining the group. My first question would be along the lines of how how do the global and intercultural competence seminars offered in your classes connect to your existing curriculum? Uh, uh, well, thanks for having me, Udo. Um, first off, you know, the school that I work at is an international baccalaureate school. And so as part of being an international baccalaureate school, we look at the world as a whole and not just being here in Missoula, Montana. So um, one of the things that I think that really – Um, your program brings to the table is a view, a connection throughout the entire world that we aren't just uh, part of this little tiny uh, city in this big state, uh, but we're part of this giant world. And um, the fact that you come in uh, and you bring 
uh, a perspective from someone who maybe was not born in the United States and you come in and you bring this connection to the world that these kids, some have been exposed to, but many have not been exposed to, uh, really enriches what we do as an international baccalaureate school. How can global and intercultural awareness and competence help students develop skills to interact respectfully with those who are different from them? I, I think that it just opens their eyes to other th things and other people and other cultures that um, even though you know, they may be different, there, there's not necessarily one that's right or wrong but that there may be other views out there, there may be other cultures out there and other beliefs that are different from what they may see in their home or even in the school that they're in. And I think it just, it, it opens their eyes that there are other possibilities of cultures and beliefs and thoughts and feelings about the world. And that even though it may be different than what they see, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just, expands their thought and opens their minds to something other than what they may be accustomed to. It sort of takes them a little bit out of their comfort zone uh, to be 10 years old and to, to see something, a different culture, a different, um, a different food, a different language, a different way of living, um, I think really sort of opens their eyes and makes them have questions and engage maybe in conversation that they wouldn't otherwise feel comfortable doing as, you know, a 10 year old. How can, how can culturally diverse students in the classroom help their peers directly or indirectly understand diverse cultures? I think that the program that you bring sort of opens the door for that. I think that some kids uh, in our school may not even realize that they come from a different uh, family makeup or a different cultural background than the students around them. And so having you talk about these different cultures and language and awareness sort of allows them to have sort of a sense of pride and ownership of who they might be and who their families might be and their background and where they come from. So instead of maybe feeling insecure or not being sure how to express who they are, um, you allow that to be something that they can connect with and share with their peers. And that's not always something that's easy for young kids to do. And perhaps connected to that question, how can mainstream students help their culturally diverse peers in their integration uh, in the classroom? I think it goes back to sort of the IB mission statement is that recognizing that even though we are all different, we're all still part of the same world and that we, one person may look different or talk differently or uh, come from different cultural backgrounds and heritage that um, we're all part of this greater community, um, be it at the school we're at, the community that we live in or on the global scale, we're all part of something together. So just understanding those differences and being willing to listen and communicate uh, effectively instead of shutting someone off or maybe not understanding why they are the way that they are. New Zealand, for example, when there was uh, a volcano and the kids connected to that, which connects to another student who may have lived there. Um, and then we, we, we see all sorts of these different small connections and sort of aha moments um, when students are able to say, for example, the Fez hat was something that a student recently brought up because we looked at a news article picture uh, from the New York Times and someone in there was wearing a Fez hat and they made that connection and then spouted right off of the countries where the Fez came from and that connection. And so um, it may seem like on some levels that it's small things, but it does, it, it does bring out this... Um, ability in kids uh, who may not otherwise be engaged in certain things to really find something that they can connect with and take it uh, sort of the next step further and see where it's applicable in their everyday world. We see this in a newspaper. We see this in a magazine. I heard about this in this part of the world, and now they have this connection and understanding of where that part of the world might actually be. 
um, from you know the types of less lessons that you do. Well, what I always appreciated uh, was that you would actually pass the hat around while I was talking about the specific hat, and it gave students the opportunity to have sort of a tactile experience in 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 touching the hat and the material it uh, it is made out of the design perhaps. Um, any kind of a special feature that the hat might have that gives us an indication of, you know, wider brim, uh, warmer climate, more sun shield, more sun protection, those kind of things. And it's different when you do it up front and you hold the hat up. And I can't, I can't sort of walk through the classroom and do it and then be next to my screen with slides and bullets at the same time. So I think that really has worked well that you, that you made it possible for the kids in the classroom to actually um, touch and feel the hat. And I've also tried doing this myself by just sending the hat around, but I found that if it's not guided by a teacher, the hat just stays somewhere and others are waiting for it and it never comes to them until almost the end of the session. And then it sort of, you know, causes the opposite frustration in kids that they didn't have access to the prop. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to thank you for, for having done that because I think that's a big part of it. Sure. Sort of along the lines of how, how can students be encouraged so they can continue to develop their own global and intercultural competence outside of their traditional uh, learning environment like a classroom? I think conversations with kids is so valuable. Um, you know, if, if children are fortunate enough to be able to travel, um, that's obviously such a huge benefit, but I know that that's not the case for everybody and it's not in everybody's wheelhouse and comfort zone. But, um, you know, I think even in a town like Missoula, we have an opportunity um, on various levels to engage with different cultures. You know, we have a large... Native American population in Montana. We have a fairly large refugee population in Montana. Um, our fourth grade uh, team goes to uh, the food bank uh, and volunteers a couple times a year. And experiences like that, just to simply get kids out of their comfort zone and see that not everyone may live like them, um, I think is so valuable. Um, and you know, it doesn't have to be traveling to a foreign country to make a student uh, be aware of the world around them. Um, I think programs like yours are, are so valuable in that they do expose children to thoughts and understandings and cultures that are different than theirs. Um, and so I think, you know, I said this earlier, but in a, a rural state like Montana, where we're oftentimes looking at people who look like us and talk like us and think like us, it is so valuable that we can expose children to cultures and thoughts and understandings and perspectives that may be different than theirs. So any way that does that um, with, you know, without casting judgment or persuading a, someone one way or the other, being as neutral, I guess, as you can in that, but just exposing them to perspectives and helping them to, you know, have conversations with their parents uh, about what makes them different. What, what do they agree and disagree with about um, just getting Getting kids to think about that and having conversations with people that they trust, I think, is such a valuable thing. Thank you. Do you recall any uh, sort of moments, interactions with kids, reactions um, on the material itself uh, and the, the countries we, we featured and the hats we covered? Uh, anything that, that you want to add sort of on a, on a personal note? Um, I do remember one student specifically talking about his time living in New Zealand um, with his family um, and sort of the connection there to wildlife and things that you also showed as well. Um, there was another student who spent uh, time living with his family in Africa and who also made connections to um, some of the geographical locations there and some of the wildlife as well. Um, I think, you know, again, on a personal level, some of the kids who, um, even from a year or two ago, who uh, grew up in Saudi Arabia and making that sort of connection to things that they remembered from there but hadn't been living there for a while. Um, and then again, those students who maybe weren't as engaged 
in everyday school, having that opportunity um, and seeing them just frantically writing down notes to try to remember exactly what you had said about a specific hat or a specific culture um, or some fact to them that was really unique and important. Whereas if I had required and said, you have to take notes this whole time, then it, it sort of takes away from their ownership of their learning and understanding of what you're doing. So um, those specific, you know, times are probably the most memorable is when, when you see those kids who, you know, again, with passing the hat around and seeing it and having some thoughts and understandings about it and what do they notice and what do they wonder about it, um, really being the most powerful sort of learning, I think, that, that we can have. And, and, of course, your presence and knowledge about so many of the cultural aspects um, the students really admire and, and I think are more engaged with that than if it were just me telling them about um, Hans Regal from Bonn. So <laughs> you I, won't ever forget, I won't ever forget where Haribo comes from, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. I would like to thank Andrew Wyatt, fourth grade teacher from Lewis and Clark Elementary School in Missoula for his involvement in this podcast. Thank you for listening, or as we say in German, Danke schön fürs Zuhören. I would also like to thank the members of the elementary school panel that participated in this podcast. Five elementary school teachers and one principal. Barbara Matz from Rattlesnake School, Ashley Flanagan and Amanda Randstrom, both teachers at Janet Rankin School, Andrew Wyatt from Lewis and Clark School, and Carla Wohler from Charlo School. In addition, Vinnie Giamona, principal at Chief Charlo School, provided an educational leadership perspective on global and intercultural teaching and learning. Please join us for part two next month when the International Voices podcast panel discussion will continue with teachers from three Missoula Middle and one high school talking about global and intercultural teaching and learning in their classrooms. International Voices with Udo Fluck is brought to you by Global and Cultural Affairs of Arts Missoula and The Trail 1033. This and previous International Voices podcasts can be found at artsmissoula.org and thetrail1033.com. <laughs>